Welcome to Timeless Odyssey, exploring science fiction through the ages. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. Today I'm going to review the 2018 film UFO. Now this review was originally part of my Geekin' New Year's Eve live stream, but I thought it deserved to be the inaugural episode of this show. So, the following is transcribed. So, as I wait another 50-ish minutes for the Central Time Zone uh, stuff, let me do a little review that I mentioned I was going to do for my uh, Timeless Odyssey show. But I thought, you know, if I'm going to try to stuff five hours worth of content into something, um, in addition to r relying on you, my viewers, uh, to provide me with things to talk about, which you've done a great job so far. I could have never gotten through that hour just based on what I've got. I did want to review a nifty little film, at least I think it is, um, for, called uh, UFO from uh, 2018, I believe. Um, UFO is kind of interesting. By the way, if the uh, background bridge sounds are too much, uh, let me know. I think I've got them set low enough so that they're not going to be uh, uh, problematic. By the way, this is also something that I have looping, and it is going at, uh, I got it upscaled to uh, 4K and 60 frames per second, although, again, you're only seeing 1080p. Anyway, I uh, caught this one because I had said in the past, in my last Where the Hell Am I Going with my show um, video, that um, in my opinion, all of the great things that we used to think were great are just now dead. They have been sacrificed at the altar of wokeness. Um, Star Wars is dead. Star Trek is dead. Um, Doctor Who which I have a review of later on. It'll be the last Doctor Who I ever do. Um, Doctor Who is dead. Indiana Jones is dead. You name it, they have all been killed and laid at the altar of wokeness. I can no longer stand to watch any of them. Marshall says, UFO, not a bad flick, not a great flick, but it does make you think. Uh, you need to review First Signal. Haven't heard of that one. I actually do know what I'm going to review next, um, but... Uh, I uh, I saw this one and was rather surprised by it. Um, so, uh, yeah, Super Guru 63 says Space 1999, made by the people that did Thunderbirds, Argo, and UFO, and The Andersons. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, the Andersons' first live action show. Um, they had previously been doing nothing but uh, Super Marionation, which was uh, essentially puppets, but pretty good stuff. Um, regardless, except for UFO, I'm sorry, I should say UFO was their first live action. And at one point they had thought about pitching Space 1999 as a sequel to UFO. That wasn't what it really was, but they thought about pitching it that way for a while. So kind of getting back to the Geek and New Year part of this, I'm going to do a uh, little review of uh, UFO from 2018. Um, obviously, spoilers involved. I, I didn't take the time to make up my big spoiler alert stuff, but clearly there's going to be spoilers involved. Um, the video is currently, the movie is currently free with ads on YouTube. There is a link to it in my description box. Do feel free to go and watch that if you feel like watching it. UFO is billed as starring Gillian Anderson from The X-Files, but as is the case with a lot of indie films, um, she doesn't actually appear in that much of it. She is a supporting character. Um, the actual star is uh, Alex Sharp, who plays a college student named uh, Derek uh, at Chevaro, I believe is how it's pronounced. Now, the plot for UFO is actually very simple. Derek believes that when he was a young boy, he saw a UFO. And as a college student, he then... Uh, there's a UFO incident at the Cincinnati International Airport in 2017 that motivates him to prove that the existence of USOs, UFOs are extraterrestrial in origin. And by the way, I will mention to you that I'm always thrilled when these indie companies and indie film companies don't base their movies in Los Angeles. We have too many movies that are based in Los Angeles. We need them taking place somewhere else. 
you know, one of the reasons that I like watching, uh, I, I've watched a lot of the um, Murdoch mysteries, right, is because it actually takes place in Toronto. You know, it's not shot in Toronto and takes place, the setting is somewhere else. It's actually Toronto. You know, we need more movies like that. I, I want somebody to come out and make a movie that's, you know, in Omaha, Nebraska, or in this case, Cincinnati. We, the last time we saw something in Cincinnati was what? WKRP in Cincinnati? You know, way back in the 70s, 80s? So thank you guys um, for doing, for watching, for making something that takes place other than, you know, in Los Angeles. Uh, Tree, Tree Three Climber says, just watched UFO and enjoyed it. Yes, yes, I'll mention why I enjoyed it. But um, anyway, the plot, um, Derek is then seeking assistance uh, for figuring all this out from his girlfriend. Uh, yeah, Marcia says, I swear to God, I thought turkeys could fly. And if you know Debbie KRP, that's one of the funniest lines ever said. But Derek seeks uh, assistance from his girlfriend, Natalie, uh, played by Ella Purnell, whom fans may recognize by from I when I looked her on IMDb. She's done a lot of voices. Uh, for Star Trek uh, Prodigy. Uh, I don't recognize her from that because I don't watch any of the garbage that has that hack fraud uh, Alex Kurtzman's name on it. But Derek also seeks help from his uh, higher mathematics. What, what math it is isn't quite ever explained. I'm sure if you were more into math as part of what you do, you'd know exactly what it was, but it's some higher mathematics. Um, his professor, uh, Dr. Hendricks, who is played by Jillian Anderson. Now, mathematics is actually um, the real star of this film. Uh, via a combination of calculations and social engineering, uh, Derek is able to crack an obscure signal sent by the aliens in their brief appearance over the Cincinnati International Airport. But along the way, Derek's obsession with cracking this code leads him to let his studies slide. He alienates all his friends um, and uh, he finds Dr. Hendricks not particularly responsive when he goes to her with the problem. She plays uh, a jaded kind of middle-aged professor who believes that any major contributions she may have made to science are long behind her and tells Derek, you know, you may never figure this out. This is not something you can sit here and obsess over. The best you can do is leave it alone for a while and maybe it'll come to you eventually. However, it is her who comes up with the final missing piece of the puzzle. And this is where Gillian Anderson shows how she's a good actress because, you know, most of the time you just don't see much of her. She's being a teacher. She's telling Derek, and you know, you're screwing up. you got to do your work. Um, and when he comes to her for advice in the middle of the night, she's like, this is all OK. I see where you're going with this, but you're just not going to do it. You know, it's not going to happen for you. But then the light bulb goes on over her head and she says, you know, right pointedly to him when he figures it out, when she figures it out in the middle of the class, that could be significant, couldn't it, Derek? It could be significant, Derek, and, and clearly has this epiphany that, my God, I've just come up with the answer to this problem. Um, and so it's pretty cool. Uh, Marshall says uh, the math is tensor equations. At least that's how it's portrayed, even though the equations didn't make much sense. Well, admittedly, I did not follow all the math. Um, I could follow some of it. I could follow some of the principles that they were using behind it. Um, but I'm not that far into mathematics to know for sure, you know, whether what they were doing made a lot of sense. Aside from the fact that, you know, when like Derek was calculating where the UFO should have been located versus where the government was saying it was located, I was like, okay, yeah, that all makes perfect sense. You know, what frequencies that were using the UFO was using, that made sense to me to some extent. Parallel to all of this going on uh, with Derek is um, an FBI agent, Frank Alls, who's played by David Strathairn. Strathairn, I, I hope I'm pronouncing his name out. Fans probably remember him as the Belter Commander, uh, Klaus uh, Ashford in The Expanse. But he has an impressive uh, number of film credits, 139 film credits, uh, acting credits taking him all the way back to 1964. He's got three more in post right now. 
He was nominated for an Oscar in 2006 for Good Night and uh, Good Luck and has a rather impressive 13 wins and 46 nominations for various other projects and uh, things. He has, he's an extremely popular character actor. Um, he's a face that you will recognize even if you don't know his name. Now, FBA agent um, Alls is also seeking uh, the how to crack this message left by the UFO, um, though with far more resources behind him than Derek has, but oddly enough, with less success than Derek. And Derek is just absolutely, you know, uh, obsessing over the whole thing. Uh, in fact, at one point, the uh, FBI starts to monitor his progress because they realize he's making actual real progress where maybe they aren't. Um, and in fact, when he finally figures it out, what it is, what the message ultimately is, is where the UFO is going to appear next. Um, and when Derek figures it out, in the last second, of course, um, he figures it out just in time to get in a car and drive there. Uh, the uh, FBI show up um, a couple of minutes later. They were actually behind him on figuring it out. They probably looked at what he suddenly realized and went to follow him. Refreshing, re very ref refreshing, re ref <laughs> refreshingly, my mouth is getting dry, excuse me. This film avoids the incredibly overused trope of a government entity intent on you know, grabbing and weaponizing the aliens while simultaneously killing off anybody who gets in the way. You know, Agent Alls is looking for exactly the same answers as Derek and for basically the same reasons. They're not working against each other. They happen to have parallel stories and Derek is the one who gets to the finish line first. When they finally catch up to this UFO and its next sighting, Alls then takes Derek into his confidence and shows him that it then transmitted a second message. Now, the first message was in a two-dimensional, you know, sort of thing. It was, you could map it out on a two-dimensional piece of paper. Alls shows him that the second message is three-dimensional. It is a cube and is massively more complex. Um, the, second, the, second, the first message was just to say, okay, here's where we're going to be next time. Let's see if you can figure that out. They figured it out, so there's another message sent, just a massive, incredibly complex message. And, uh, you know, Derek says, geez, how, how is this, you know, how long is it going to take you to do this? And he said, well, could be years or maybe months with you helping us. So we go out with the notion that, yeah, basically, Derek is going to go help the FBI try to figure out this problem. And the FBI is not sitting there trying to do mean, nasty, awful things. Um, they are simply looking for the answers, the same as Derek, and he happens to be one step ahead of them. Um, and they're using him, no question about that, but they're not like going in and trying to stop him. They're realizing, hey, wait a minute, this kid's onto something. We need to pay attention to him. They're not, you know, it's not something where he has to go to them and scream, I've got the, you know, I've got the answer. Oh, go away, kid. Or, uh oh, this kid's getting clued too close to the answer. We've got to do something about it. It's nothing like that at all. There are no mustache twirling villains. There are no men in black trying to get in the way of the solving the problem. There is no real traditional external antagonist at all. Uh, Climber 3 says, uh, yeah, the actor was in, CIA, he was CIA director in The Born Identity. Yeah, he did he did a whole bunch of stuff like that. Uh, he's, he has so many credits. Again, he's an actor, if you, if you don't know his name, you've seen his face. He's a character actor who's been around since 1964. If you don't know his name, you've seen his face. Marshall says, I did like the plot twist that uh, we didn't know uh, the position on the universal constant, uh, on the universal constant to the to the left, uh, we could decode the message, and that was wickedly good. Yes, to the point where we could decode. Yeah, I, that that's what I really liked about this movie. Uh, the The antagonist really is the mathematics itself, and the effect that it then has Derek on Derek and those around them. Now there is no real resolution as to who the aliens are nor where they came from. This isn't close encounters of the third kind. It's not E.T. It's not like any modern alien encounter story. The alien spaceship only appears long enough to emit a message and then disappears. We as viewers only get 
brief glimpses of it. The second sighting, the big one that Derek has been working for, the camera shows it so that he is clearly seeing it, takes out his camera to take a picture, and then goes to it for us, and we see it only for just a fraction of a second before it goes away. And that's fine. It works perfectly in a movie like this. In, in drama, in general, there are three traditional types of stories. Man versus man, man versus nature, and man versus himself. And UFO is a story of man versus himself in the form of Derek and how his obsession in cracking the message impacts himself and those around him. Now, a lot of critics have given this film lukewarm or even bad reviews, and I think that's because they don't know anything about math. This film tickles my brain the same way that The Expanse tickled my brain, because it uses real math, even though, as Marshall says, it may not make a whole lot of sense. But, but as he says, the universal constant um, being a, you know, a big deal, when Dr. Hendricks you know, realizes that the common distance denominator that Derek's been searching for is the 21 centimeter hydrogen line. I just about, to, I, oh God, what a, that's an incredible idea. Why would I have not thought of that before? It's that kind of movie that keeps a smart person who knows a little bit about math kind of on the edge of your seat because you're like, okay, I can kind of figure this out. I can kind of follow what they're doing. I don't really understand the math, but I can see what they're going with, and it makes sense. And this kid's getting really, you know, just absolutely obsessed with it. And, and it, it's the sort of thing where it makes for sense. Um, uh, Tree, Tree Three Climber says, uh, enjoyed the movie? Quite surprised. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I, I just ran across this one. Just totally ran across it by accident on YouTube. Um, saw that Jillian Anderson was in it, and I went, well, that's kind of strange. She kind of said that she was never going to do any more, you know, sci-fi. So I, I watched it and went, oh, God, this is great, you know. Marshall says the critics have, uh, uh, have also hate contact uh, because they were too dumb to understand it. Yeah, people who could understand the concept generally liked it. Uh, it worked on that one. Yeah, and it, for me, it's the same reason here. And by the way, if you don't know, the 21 centimeter hydrogen line is basically background radiation left over from the Big Bang. It is everywhere in the universe, so it makes perfect sense that it would be the key to some type of universal measurement. So, um, if you're looking for action, UFO isn't for you. If you're looking for aliens, then UFO isn't for you. If you're looking for a lot of pew pew and stuff like that, UFO is not for you. But if you're looking for a relatable college student banging his head against the wall over math and just alienating everybody in the process, then UFO is definitely for you. As a hard science fiction film, and by that I mean there's basically two kinds of science fiction. Hard science fiction, which tries to take into account real science as much as possible. And then there's soft science fiction that doesn't so much. You know, if you're going to classify Star Wars as science fiction, Star Wars is definitely soft science fiction. It's also space opera and stuff like that. Whole other kind of stuff. But this is a hard science fiction thing, much like, um, you know, The Expanse was hard science fiction. But I don't think it's hard science fiction, and particularly in indie film, I don't think there's anything bad about this. In fact, I think, you know, Ryan uh, Esslinger, who wrote and directed it, I think the direction is perfectly fine. There was nothing ever that jumped out at me as being bad. And in point of fact, at the end, where, where you're just going, okay, okay, we're going to see the aliens. Finally, we're going to see the aliens. We're going to see the aliens. And Derek pulls up, stops his car, gets out, takes out his phone. We can see that he's seeing the damn aliens. <laughs> But we don't see them. And just the flicker for a moment, that's all we needed. And I thought that bit of direction was really, really good. Um, Marshall says, almost everywhere you see hydrogen. Interesting things on the horizon uh, on that front coming up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes, UFO was a scientific drama more than sci-fi. Yeah. But it still tickled my brain, you know, the same way that, um, that uh, The Expanse did. The only thing, and this is just a minor quibble, um, that you might have was Alex Sharp's casting. He was 29 when this film was shot. Um, looks a little bit too old to be a college student. Um, however, 
as the story progresses and he becomes more and more obsessed with this, you know, the bags under his eyes make more sense because here's a kid who has been spending night and day trying to figure it out, completely obsessed, you know, just alienating all of his friends, not showing up to labs that one of his friends uh, has to get something done so she can get into a good doctoral program. And he blows her off completely, doesn't care at all. Um, you know, alienates everybody. And it just makes sense after a while because he's just totally focused on this one thing. Again, it is a man versus himself kind of story. Um, so as a hard science indie film, as again, it's low budget. This is not something where you're going to have a huge budget. I don't know what it cost. I didn't look it up. I would certainly give this an 8 out of a 10. Um, if you, you know, you just have to go into it knowing that you are not going to get the answers at the back of the book. You're just not going to. Um, this is a story about science and math and, and what it does to the people who are trying to fix it. And again, I really liked that it did not take place in Los Angeles. It was set somewhere else, thank God. And it did not use this trope of the government trying to get in the way. It had the government on a parallel journey to Derek and eventually realizing, hey, wait a minute, I think this kid may be onto something. We should pay attention to him, not bring him into the fold until the very end, but, you know, start paying attention to what he's doing. Yeah, they have him, you know, being bugged and stuff like that. Um, but uh, that, too, that, too, is used as a way for him to have alienated one of his friends. His roommate is a big stoner. And at one point, Derek comes in, realizes that his computer's been tampered with, calls campus police, and they show up and find his, uh, his, um, um, his roommate's weed. So, again, alienating one of his friends with his total obsession on trying to get this taken care of. Uh, and Marshall says, actually, you get the better response. You know you're asking the right questions. The answer is not relevant. Very hard concept for most to grasp. Yes, that's, that's just exactly right. It's why I don't think reviewers rate this as highly as it should. This is something where they probably expect to see the answer. You know, what are the aliens? What's this? What's that? No, it's not what it's about. It's about a guy, very smart guy, who is, you know, it is man versus himself how he gets himself totally engrossed in this one thing, screws up his studies, alienates everybody around him, and the only good thing at the end is there's a redeemable thing because the FBI agent says, hey, you know, it's going to take us forever, but maybe if you come on board, we will be able to get this taken care of earlier. So that's, that's very cool, and I like that very much. So again, solid 8 out of 10. I have rewatched the movie. I, I always watch something I'm going to review at least twice. But this is a movie I can go back and rewatch. Absolutely. I could go back and rewatch it right now and still have a good time. It's just that sort of tickle your brain kind of science fiction. So for my next review, this is another one that I just accidentally ran across. It is another low budget film, only this time it is about a homicide detective who keeps getting phone calls from his beloved niece several days before she was murdered. So go out and stream yourself a copy of 2019's Don't Let Go, because that's the next one I'm going to do. Um, it's a really kind of interesting movie. It is, it is not time travel. It is, if you could stop this murder, how would you do it? And uh, it goes from there. The biggest name in it is uh, Alfred Molina, although um, if you haven't seen him lately, you might not recognize who he is. But again, a, a relatively small indie movie, but very, very good. Um, certainly don't go to any, uh, you know, perfectly legitimate uh, Russian streaming sites to find it the way I accidentally ran across it. So um, that's uh, most of that that I've got for that review. I've got another one for the uh, most recent Doctor Who um, that I'm going to save for the time period between um, uh, Central and Mountain Time Zones uh, fireworks. Pardon me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, for those that haven't seen, I upgraded my, my booze uh, from last year. I mean, I guess it's an upgrade. Um, last year or the year before, whenever I did one of these last, uh, the only thing that I had in the house was Everclear. So I went out and I, um, you know, I, I splurged 
and I got myself a juice box of Sutter Home uh, Cabernet Char Sauvignon. Um, wine in a juice box. And I have tasted it once uh, just before we did uh, the Eastern Time Zone fireworks. Yeah, it's, it's still pretty much swill. Um, as uh, Steve Martin once said about sparkling Muscatel in the uh, Muppet movie, one of the finest wines of Idaho, you know. And uh, you want to smell the bottle cap? <laughs> any, any wine that comes in a juice box, man, that's, that's the wine for me. So um, that's my review of UFO. Um, go and watch it. Uh, it's on YouTube right now with uh, commercials. Go and watch the thing. I think it's a, it's a solid 8 out of 10. Uh, Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing the control and manipulation of minds.